Hey guys, my name is Joe, and today we're going to be talking about G protein coupled receptors. So, the what before we even go ahead and get talking about G protein coupled receptors, we need to talk a little bit about cellular communication in general. So, this that I've drawn behind me is the plasma membrane of a cell. It doesn't really matter what kind of cell, let's just say it's a cell. And this side is going to be the inside of the cell, and this side is going to be the outside. So, it's really important for cells to be able to communicate with each other and with the rest of the body because they need to constantly be aware of their environment. So this needs to, communication needs to happen from inside to outside and from outside to inside. And there's actually two ways that communication in general happens. So the first way that you guys are probably most familiar with is um, you can have a, a signaling molecule that will travel from, let's say it's made outside of the cell and it, tr it needs to get into the cell. So the signaling molecule will travel through a membrane protein, an ion channel, or what, what, whatever type it may be, to get to wherever it needs to go and relay its message that way. And th in that case, it would literally cross the membrane to get to where it needs to go. The other type of signaling pathway that's not uh, quite as familiar to most students is signaling transduction pathways. In a signaling transduction pathway, you would have the signaling molecule, and it would attach itself to a membrane-bound protein, which would then cause something to happen on the other side of the molecule, uh, I'm sorry, on the other side of the membrane, inside or outside of the cell. Uh, and that's called signal transduction. So in that case, you would have the primary messenger attaching to a membrane-bound protein, which then passes the signal on to some kind of secondary messenger to make the whole signaling cascade keep going, but the original primary messenger doesn't cross the membrane. So that's an important distinction that we need to make because G protein coupled receptors are an example of signal transduction. This is the basic setup for all uh, G protein coupled receptors that you see drawn behind me. This big guy right here is the actual receptor. This is the G protein coupled receptor. The way it works is you have a signaling molecule, which can be a lot of different things, by the way, because G proteins encompass a whole family of receptors. They do everything from uh, helping you smell to your fight or flight response. So for today, just to make things easy, they all work the same way, but we're going to specifically talk about epinephrine. Epinephrine, also called adrenaline, uses G protein coupled receptors to do a fight or flight response. Um, but all G protein coupled receptors will work this same way exactly. So let's say we have a molecule of epinephrine. It would come in and it would bind to the G protein coupled receptor in whichever cell it's targeting. Now, on this G protein coupled receptor, you have three subunits you have an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. The alpha subunit is drawn in a special color because it does, it does, most, of, it does most of the brute work. Uh, beta and gamma do other things that we'll talk about in a minute, but for now the alpha subunit has a GDP attached to it. Once this epinephrine molecule, or whatever the signaling molecule may be, binds to the receptor, this GDP leaves and is replaced with a GTP. Notice that the GDP doesn't get uh, phosphorylated to GTP. Literally, the entire GDP molecule leaves and is replaced by an entirely new GTP molecule. So now, once the alpha subunit has its GTP bound to it, it leaves. It dissociates from the GPCR, and it moves and attaches itself to adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase is this other membrane-bound protein. And what adenylyl cyclase does, as the name would imply, it takes adenosine, or in this case more specifically, AMP, and cyclicizes it to make cyclic AMP. So adenylyl cyclase takes AMP and makes it into cyclic AMP as long as the alpha subunit is attached to it. So 
Now, cyclic AMP is a very important second messenger. It's really important because it does a lot of different things depending on what this original signaling molecule is. So notice now epinephrine has initiated this whole signaling transduction pathway, but it hasn't crossed the membrane itself. So right now it's essentially handed the baton over to cyclic AMP and said, all right, you go finish the race for me. I'm done. So cyclic AMP, what it does is it comes over here and it activates a, this protein called protein kinase A. Now protein kinase A does a lot of different things depending on what the original signaling molecule is. Um, and it also, there's also different types of protein kinase A, but they all work the same exact way. So we're just going to talk about a general mechanism today. They all have this sort of head with two tails. Each tail has a catalytic subunit attached to a regulatory subunit. So as long as these regulatory subunits are attached to the catalytic subunits, this protein doesn't do anything. So right now, this is off. Now, once cyclic AMP comes and binds to protein kinase A, or interacts with it rather, uh, cyclic AMP comes and interacts with protein kinase A, what it does is it causes these catalytic subunits to leave. Notice that's a common theme here. So, these catalytic subunits dissociate from protein kinase A and float off into um, the cytosol to do whatever it is that that specific reaction needs done. And in the case of epinephrine, this would cause your fight or flight response, you know, when your heart rate gets going and your pupils dilate. Um, so as long as cyclic AMP is present, it's going to cause the catalytic subunits to be dissociated from protein kinase A. Now, if we go back up to here, whenever we want this whole pathway to stop, we take GTP and we hydrolyze it back to GDP. So notice that it's the opposite of what happens here. We don't take the whole GTP off and replace it with a whole new GDP. What we do is we take GTP and we just cut off a phosphate group to make GDP. And that makes sense if you think about it because going from GTP to GDP is really energetically favorable. That's a really good exothermic reaction. So we're going to want that to happen. So this gets hydrolyzed back to GDP, and the alpha subunit goes back and attaches to G, the G protein coupled receptor. The epinephrine leaves, the whole thing stops. Okay? That is what is supposed to happen ideally. Now, of course, we have ways of regulating this pathway that are really important when this doesn't quite happen the way it's supposed to. So we're going to talk next about regulating G protein coupled receptors. All right, so we've got the same membrane as before. And the same G protein as before. So let's say that this G protein is active. So we've got a molecule in its active site. That marker looks dead. We've got a molecule in its active site, and so this is on, which means that you've got the beta subunit, and you've got the gamma subunit, but the alpha subunit is off with adenyl cyclase like we just learned. Well, now once these beta and gamma subunits are alone for some time without the alpha subunit, they begin to realize that there may be something wrong and that this pathway should not still be on. So what happens when you leave, um, what happens when you leave the beta and gamma subunits alone for some time is they recruit this protein called beta 
adrenergic receptor kinase. And notice that we're still talking about epinephrine. This is specifically regulation of epinephrine. Uh, it works similarly in other G proteins, but for this example, we're going to talk specifically about epinephrine because that's the one that uh, your professor mentions in the notes. So the beta and gamma subunits recruit a molecule called beta adrenergic receptor kinase, and they bring it to the membrane, or BARC as we can call it. So the function of BARC, as you guys could probably guess from the name, it's a kinase, so it's going to phosphorylate things. So when this molecule is brought to the membrane, it phosphorylates the G protein. Right, so now we have these phosphorylated, this phosphorylated G protein, um, beta adrenergic receptor kinase has done its job, so it leaves. So, bark is gone, but we, but now, this is phosphorylated. So, floating around in our cytosol, we have molecules called beta arrestin. that says beta arrestin. And when these float around and they see a G protein that's been phosphorylated, they realize that that is their signal. So this beta arrestin is going to see that this G protein has been phosphorylated and it will bind to it. Okay? So now you have, I'm going to redraw it to make it a little more clear what we've got going on here. We've got, this is the G protein coupled receptor. We've still got the beta and gamma subunits. Um, but now we've also got this new molecule on here called beta arrestin. Now, Beta arrestin takes a pretty radical approach to turning this whole thing off. Because remember, the point of this regulation is to turn this molecule off. Because right now, as long as this ligand is bound, it's on and it needs to be off. So beta arrestin realizes the alpha subunit isn't coming back, but we still want to stop this whole molecule from making more cyclic AMP because it's done what it needs to do. So when beta arrestin binds to a G protein coupled receptor, it literally takes the whole receptor and pulls it into the membrane. So, now let me redraw it one more time. What we've got going on now is we have a membrane without G protein coupled receptor, without that, that G protein coupled receptor in it. And now, And now the G protein coupled receptor is inside the cell. How much good does this do inside the cell? None. This doesn't work inside the cell because the signaling molecules that are all out here can't bind to it because there's a membrane in the way, obviously. So by pulling the whole protein into the cell, it essentially stops it from working. Uh, and so that is probably the more radical of the two approaches to regulating this whole pathway that we're going to talk about. So beta arrestin pulls in the entire receptor. The other thing that can happen is let's say we don't want to do all that. We want to take a more gentle approach. We have our membrane now. And this just has, as before, a G protein coupled receptor that is on, so it only has beta and gamma subunits. And so you're going to have a lot of cyclic AMP inside the cell, right? Well, your cell actually has an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. That's phospho diesterase. Phosphodiesterase takes cyclic AMP and breaks it back down to just regular AMP. 
So essentially that stops the whole cascade pathway in a much less dramatic way than beta arrestin's approach, which is to just pull it out of the cell. So phosphodiesterase hexacyclic AMP and degrades it. Now, when you guys drink coffee in the morning or tea or Red Bull or whatever your energy drink of choice is, what the caffeine does is it actually comes and inhibits caffeine. That, that doesn't quite look right, but you guys get the point. Uh, caffeine, all right, whatever. Caffeine inhibits phosphodiesterase. So by inhibiting phosphodiesterase, the caffeine essentially forces your body to maintain really high levels of cyclic AMP, which is what gives you all of the energy. So that's a little fun fact for you guys. This is G-protein coupled receptors. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to post them in the comments below and I'll answer them as I see them. Thank you.